The underground cities of Cappadocia, Turkey, number more than 200 and are spread across the entire region. It is highly possible that there is many more lying below the surface, just waiting to be found. Of all the underground cities discovered so far, the most awe-inspiring is perhaps the Derinkuyu city. It was discovered by accident in 1963. When a local family was renovating a house, a wall gave way to reveal a passage that led to this underground network. According to National Geographic, it is 11 levels deep, descending more than 280 feet to the bedrock, covering an area of over 4 miles squared. It includes temples, tombs, shops, living quarters, and even livestock pens. Over 15,000 air shafts were built into its design and would have been enough room to comfortably house approximately 20,000 people. The underground city has extending passages that connected to other neighboring and underground water well systems, providing fresh water. What is especially interesting regarding this underground world is the evidence to suggest that they were hiding from something terrifying. A sophisticated security system consisting of a particular build design accompanied by numerous gigantic rolling stone blocking doors that would seal the city from the inside. Moreover, its multi-layered design meant that each level could be sealed off from the next level using this same system. Just what were these people hiding from? Whatever it was, they obviously preferred to run rather than confront it. The structure was excruciatingly carved into the underground rock and is as strong today as the day it was built, safely accommodating guests such as archaeologists and tourists. Whoever built the network obviously had an advanced knowledge of stoneworking, architecture, engineering, and the local geography. Aging the structure has proven very difficult. There are no existing quarries, waste piles, or tools to examine. Furthermore, there are no records documenting its construction or people who may have lived there. Also, unfortunately, many cultures have used the underground towns over the centuries. According to UNESCO, it is believed that the first signs of monastic activity in Cappadocia date back to the 4th century at which time acting on the instructions of Basil the Great in order to resist attacks from the Arabs, the people should band together into small, local communities and begin inhabiting cells dug into the rock. Therefore, modern academia tends to conclude that they were likely built by the Phrygian people around 800 BC. Yet it is also a strong possibility that they are far older than this. By the bishop's instruction, they are to inhabit, not build. Therefore, it's safe to assume he was aware of their existence rather than the person who thought them up. Some believe the underground caves were constructed by the very ancient Persian king Yima. Yima, attributed as mythological by many, is said to have had a lifespan of more than 900 years, a common feature of biblical figures as well. The Zoroastrian text Vendidad states that Yima built an underground city on the orders of the god Ahura Mazda to protect his people from a catastrophic winter. Much like the account of Noah in the Bible, Yima was instructed to collect pairs of the best animals and people as well as the best seeds in order to reseed the earth after the winter cataclysm. This was before the last ice age, 110,000 years ago. Although the Roman Empire are largely attributed with the invention of countless ingenious inventions, the truth regarding the origin of these innovations, however, may in all possibility be placed far earlier in human history. Many individual researchers, those whom are fortunately not responsible for telling lines of modern paradigm, have long claimed, just as mystery history is often posited, many said developments can in fact be identified at many other, far older ancient ruins many predating that of the Roman Empire by millennia. These repeated earlier discoveries, along with their inexplicably rapid societal advancement, is compelling evidence to support the postulation that, just like that of the ancient Egyptians, the Romans merely adopted lost technologies, along with many ancient architectural wonders, subsequently claiming them as their own, was merely to create an illusionary air of intimidation, which would have surrounded their claimed capabilities. This fitting, if highly controversial hypothesis could undoubtedly explain the ongoing mystery surrounding the remarkable success of the ancient Romans, their empire's longevity, and ultimately, their stagnation and eventual demise. We have in the past explored the astonishing irrigation systems of pre-Incan Peru, along with that of the sewage and water systems of Pompeii, a literal time capsule, long encased in volcanic ash, not rediscovered until very recently. Yet, thanks to this incredible preservation, 
we were able to identify compelling anomalous features like that of the heavily rutted polygonal roadways. Specifically, we focused upon the elaborate, highly sophisticated sewage system once placed beneath its still unexplained enigmatic roadways. A system still functional to this day, yet the most compelling of all is its metallurgy. The singular characteristic, which we feel proves beyond any doubt that such exquisite systems are not the work of the well-studied Roman Empire, but are instead a relic of a far more advanced, far more technologically capable, yet now lost civilization. For although like that of the unexplained Peruvian systems, it is still functional, a testament to the constructor past precision and workmanship, yet most interesting fact is that the pipes which served clean drinking water were all constructed from tin, while those transporting waste were made of lead. The reason why this is a compelling fact is because whoever built this system were fully aware of lead poisoning, yet the apparently more modern systems, presumably copied by Romans, were all made from lead. The reason for this is that at the time of the Roman Empire, lead poisoning was not yet understood. Cloaca Maxima, which translates as the Great Sewer, is yet another of these astonishing relics, actively being dismissed as the work of the Romans. Although its tremendous age is undeniable, and the fact that mainstream academia accepts it as having predated the Roman settlement itself, it is regardless still claimed as the work of the Romans. The Cloaca Maxima sewage system, just like that of Pompeii's and those of Peru, are all still functional to this day. This incredible longevity, we feel, is further proof of its original creator's tremendous capabilities. According to Pliny the Elder, an ancient Roman author and someone who could be perceived as one of the original funded opposition, claimed that the center section is centuries older than the surrounding system, with the entire relic claimed as having predated the empire itself by more than 500 years. Yet Pliny the Elder, who was tasked by Rome to explain the site's origins, claimed to have somehow known the intricate details surrounding who built the Great Sewer. After researching this relic, we have found large volumes of funded research concerning its past function and the claimed construction during the Roman Empire. However, regardless of this claimed tale of events, the fact that this technology, this incredibly advanced structural technique would have been in its infancy at the time it is currently claimed as having been made, yet is still in use today and has not needed any substantial modification for over 2,000 years. How can one explain how a seemingly new technology was utilized and perfected first time during this brief window in world history? The Cloaca Maxima is undoubtedly an incredible ancient relic, one which we find highly compelling. We have often explored the many curious tales of a particular ancient global catastrophe. The Great Flood, a global deluge featured in countless ancient accounts. Yet additionally, we have also recently explored the compelling evidential corroboration to these ancient claims, supportive geological and scientific evidence, which intriguingly support their indeed once being such a flood, one of biblical proportions. The geological data supporting the change in sea levels are deserts once seabeds, submerged pyramids, ruins, and not to mention the tales of Atlantis. However, one area which is rarely, if ever mentioned in these same libraries of history, are the underground cities once built. All of them, found on nearly every continent, were each buried beneath the earth in such a way as to avoid the land itself. The largest of these, Derinkuyu, discovered by complete accident during a house renovation. It strongly suggests that many more may still be laying undiscovered, waiting to see light again, resting undisturbed in complete darkness for unknown millennia. Thousands of connected tunnels have already been found and explored all over Europe, thousands of miles of interlinking underground tunneling systems, all built as if those who created them found ground level either inhospitable or of a mortally perilous place to dwell, this for some unknown reason.
Darren Kuyu, as mentioned, a site we have explored in depth before, not only has curious multi-ton rolling door stoppers located at strategic locations, stones modern man is incapable of moving, but was also reportedly lit by a natural gas pocket they tapped, tunneled a pipe through the complex with holes positioned along which, set alight as if a London Victorian street, ingenious if true, regardless of the genius that went into Derinkuyu itself. Alien corpses found within remains of the Hypogeum in Malta, it must be noted along with 7,000 other headless corpses, yet these complete bodies lay there alongside them. The oracle room within, just like the rumors of the natural light technology of Derinkuyu, also possessed, yet still possesses, its own extraordinary example of ancient high technology. With an altar stone in the oracle room placed in such a location, complemented by extraordinarily perfect architectural design, amplifies one's voice incredibly well and throughout the structure. Thousands of kilometers of groundwater-flooded caveways have recently been found in Belize, Honduras, El Salvador, along with many other locations. Littered ancient ruins, remains, and inhabitations, once this flooding is dated, we believe it will push the currently held chronology of man, and indeed these groups age, back massively. A subject we will cover soon. However, these digressions merely scratch the surface of what we intend to explore further and indeed share with all of you. So, any support in this quest is greatly appreciated. To help us out, check the description for links. Why did ancient man seemingly hide underground? Why did they make such gargantuan efforts to dig, design, and then seemingly live in these places long term? These are questions we find highly compelling. It is now a well-known, heavily studied fact that the modern-day bird was once a very different-looking animal evolution in the form of a radical transformational adaptation, forced upon them by gradual changes in the Earth's environment, from which they whence came, that being the dinosaur. We now know this to be fact, thanks to modern technology. Our capability to now scan these fossils, some found remarkably well-preserved, still fortunately containing many things, which have allowed us to discover that dinosaurs had bird brains or more accurately, birds have dinosaur brains. With current investigations even shining light upon the reality that many of these gigantic animals, including the T-Rex, once had manes made of feathers. This drastic change from the dinosaur, resulting in the vast array of creatures we see today, from the ostrich to the albatross, even to the commonly domesticated budgerigar. Yet they all share one common trait, a significant reduction in their size. Even animals which survived unchanged, such as the crocodile, still shrank considerably. This shrinking of said species, having been demanded of them by environmental changes. Evolutionary adaptation, as we have covered in the past, is, in the channel's opinion, in its true sense, an adaptation of specific sets of vertebrate types the true definition of species, not as Darwinian theory posits, of leaps between such. Thus, evolution witnessed within the animal kingdom is not indicative of a shared single ancestry, but inseparable branching from specific vertebrae or phyla groups, never proven to have leaped from one to another. As such, modern-day birds could in fact be seen as the product of de-evolutionary adaptation possibly derived from cataclysm, which deprive them of the resources needed to remain at such gigantic sizes. The reason for this digression is the channel's postulation of this same process, having once possibly occurred to Homo sapiens also. Could this explain why some of the oldest ruins are also some of the most advanced, with many remaining beyond the reach of modern man's ability to understand them? Is it possible that man once had a much higher intellect than us today, due to a far greater sized cranium? Simply put, 
Were we once giants, just as modern-day birds were once dinosaurs? Legends and accounts of ancient giants can be found all over the world, also featuring in many ancient religious teachings. Additionally, many of the still unexplained sites of Earth regularly feature doorways many feet, sometimes even meters above that which is required by and for humans of our modern scale. The Terracotta Army, for example, is believed by many independent researchers, including Mystery History, to have been made by a lost civilization, and their average height, intriguingly, is much taller than modern man. Many accounts exist of giants, which share similar descriptive characteristics. Red hair, double rowed teeth, elongated skulls, etc. With many accounts of red-headed giant remains actually discovered and excavated all over the world, yet often all that survives of these reported events is a small news article, regularly noting Smithsonian involvement in said recoveries, yet seemingly and conveniently always slipping away from the public domain. Lovelock Cave being another example, locals tell of it once being the home of a group of red-headed giants, which was eventually blocked and the giants burnt alive, a giant handprint still visible on a rock in the cave, presumably made by one of these individuals during their unpleasant demise. Yet what has to be the most compelling piece of evidence, fortunately still in view to suggest giants did indeed once exist, are footprints found all over the globe, once laid down upon sediment, now fossilized into solid stone. These footprints range in size up to a few meters in length, indicating that humans, at some point in the distant past, may have been even larger than many dinosaur species. We find the evidence to support the hypothesis of giant ancient humans highly compelling. There have recently been some astonishing academically contradictory discoveries unearthed throughout Europe. Archaeologists have been discovering a network of underground tunnels, apparently somehow cut throughout the Stone Age, which cover the territories of Spain, Turkey, and most of the European continent. Their approximate age, according to funded archaeologists, is no less than 12,000 years. Yet how people living within the Stone Age, people without any form of metal tools or chisels, manage to cut thousands of miles of tunnel systems is clearly a considerably contradictory mystery. Thousands of underground tunnels stretching from Scotland to Turkey that have, predictably, placed the many submissive, order-taking funded scientists throughout the academic world at a dead end to explain. However, if one presumes, as the evidence we share here on our channel often suggests, that a past, now lost, highly advanced civilization once flourished here on our Earth, their creation is less of a challenge to explain. Yet the purpose for their existence will remain an enigma. Were they created by a group attempting to hide from something? Or possibly, they were ancient smuggling tunnels left by members of this lost civilization once used to smuggle items from ancient settlement to settlement found throughout Europe. German archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Kusch in his book Secrets of the Underground Doors to the Ancient World states that the tunnels were dug beneath hundreds of Neolithic settlements all across Europe, and the fact that so many tunnels have survived indicates that the original network was much larger than that which still survives. Quote, in Bavaria alone, we discovered 700 meters of these underground tunnels. In the Austrian Styria, we found 350, and throughout Europe there were thousands of such tunnels, from the north of Scotland stretching to the Mediterranean itself." End quote. The fact that these tunnels have been identified as having been cut at least 12,000 years ago should indicate to all those still with the capacity of critical thought that they are undoubtedly far older than this, as to state that they were somehow cut by people with literally no tools to their disposal, to us seems laughable. The tunnels are all relatively narrow, being about 70 centimeters in width, just enough for an adult man to travel through. In some places, 
There are small rooms, storage chambers, and seats, clearly indicating that these cave systems were used by a number of people at a time. How did our ancient ancestors create such an awe-inspiring network of tunnels without the utilization of some form of tunneling equipment, lighting, and indeed smelted metal tools? It is not surprising to us or anyone who has paid attention to the limited tale of events put forward by academia that these tunnels remain a perplexing ancient artifact for them to explain. Yet we feel they are clear evidence of a past civilization having crudely cut these tunnels, possibly for some nefarious reason we are yet to unravel. They are undoubtedly highly compelling. There are many ancient anomalies which can be found upon the Giza Plateau and indeed across much of ancient Egypt as a whole. Many areas which are clear evidence of a highly capable, highly intelligent past civilization who once called this landmass home. Not only are the ancient pyramids a clear feat of incredible ancient engineering, possibly the most astonishing found the world over, but many of the still existing ancient temples are testament to a now lost, yet once incredibly advanced ancient civilization. And although many academics are funded to push the theory that the pyramids, having once been the burial places of Egyptian kings, the truth that we still do not actually know the original purpose for these ancient structures remains. Not only do these structures, along with many other areas, such as the basalt floor found at their feet, still show clear evidence of lost technology, unquestionably left by high-speed, high-rotation stone-cutting technologies, and many of the tombs and other artifacts found throughout the ancient ruins unarguably once machine-worked upon enormous, as yet unexplained lathes. But there also exist some astonishing features within the record books, documented anomalies within our own antiquity, regarding some of the biggest yet still existing anomalies within ancient Egypt, anomalies that although are now all but lost to history, have been recorded and documented since our own records began, specifically Roman records. The Colossi or Colossus of Memnon are listed as containing some of the largest megalithic blocks that have currently been recorded and investigated across the world. And although these statues have virtually crumbled over the eons, records of these statues stretches back many centuries, features now largely, and we believe, deliberately ignored by mainstream academics. These statues once possessed an astonishing characteristic one many claimed as a divine experience, one which would draw countless individuals on a pilgrimage across the desert, to witness at first light every morning. The Colossi of Memnon were built from a single piece of stone each. They are oriented towards the sunrise at winter solstice, and throughout modern study have had a number of fearless individuals expose their true past grandeur to the world. Estimates for the two statues' original weight are most commonly noted to have been around the 1,000 tons mark, with the most famous report within R. T. Gould's A Book of Marvels, 1937, which contained an estimate of 1,200 tons. The statues are made from blocks of quartzite sandstone, which was quarried at El Gabal El Amar, near modern-day Cairo, then transported 420 miles to Thebes. And although modern academia would like to attribute these feats to our more modern ancestors, namely the ancient Egyptians, any logical explanation of how this feat was achieved, or indeed how they were so precisely carved, remains absent from all explanations of these monumental statues, not only their transport and creation, but how these ancient monuments used to sing. Early Greek and Roman tourists who came to hear the sound gave the statue the name of Memnon. Memnon was a hero of the Trojan War, a king of Ethiopia, who led his armies to Troy's defense, but was ultimately slain by Achilles. Memnon was said to be the son of Eos, the goddess of dawn, and after his death, his mother is said to have shed tears every morning. The singing of the statues was attributed to this mother mourning for her son. The earliest written reference to the singing statues comes from the Greek historian and geographer Strabo, 
who claim to have heard their song during a visit in 20 BC. The second-century Greek traveler and geographer Pausanias compared it to the string of a lyre breaking. Others described it as the striking of brass or a strange, ghostly, almost divine whistling. For more than two centuries, the singing statues brought tourists from all over the empire, including several Roman emperors. Many left inscriptions on the base of the statue, reporting whether they had heard the sound or not. Nearly 90 inscriptions are still legible upon their base today. Who created these statues? How were they able to sing? They are clearly an astonishing ancient accomplishment, once achieved by a now lost advanced civilization. Monuments which we find highly compelling. We can visit other people with their habitation. We can keep track. If there's something very important to be developed from the moon, together we can explore the moon and develop the moon. We should go boldly where man has not gone before. Fly by to comets, visit asteroids, visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there?